Hey guys, it's Davy G here. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms certainly goes down as one of the most important pieces of literature of all time. The once historical characters of the Chinese Three Kingdoms period have been catapulted into the realm of demigod status by Chinese society. Through different mediums of art, mainly through operas, but in modern times, movies, TV shows, and video games, this old book still has a major influence on the psycho-cultural development of Chinese society. But what is it about a good book that can profoundly affect the psychological development of an individual? That's to say, move them. There are many books that have this capacity, but the most impactful books tend to be of a religious nature. Such books can reorientate a person's psychological makeup so completely, and if enough people in a society have the same experience, the trajectory of a whole civilization will be affected thousands of years later after the book's writing. This is what religions do to a society. But it's not often that we examine why this is the case. Karl Marx was quoted as saying that religion is the opiate of the masses, and that's still an often quoted mantra in current times. But if that were true, why would religion also invent hell? If the purpose of religion was to create a utopian fantasy to soothe the existential suffering of humanity, then why would it at the same time envision the worst possible dimension of eternal torment? For example, in pre-modern Chinese tradition, the afterlife is ruled by King Yama who presides over 10 courts. There, you will be tried based on your sins you have committed and sent to one of 18 different types of hells. There, you will receive a specific form of torture that's most suited to give you the most amount of suffering possible until it's your time to be reincarnated. That doesn't soothe my existential suffering at all. There has to be something more. So unlike what Marx says, the goal of any great religion is to map out the emergence of transcendent consciousness in human beings, thus avoiding damnation in the next life, and religions meet this aim by telling stories. Religious texts are ultimately a collection of stories, and there's no question that we love stories. And what if I told you that all stories are basically the same? Stylistically, they're different, but the structure of good stories across all cultures are the same, which is the reason you can watch my series on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms and have a deep connection to it, despite it coming from a completely alien culture and time. Philosopher Joseph Campbell was the first to recognize the alignment of all stories and dubbed it the Mono Myth. But it goes by another name, The Hero's Journey, which he writes about in his book A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, it wasn't a screenwriting book. It was just a book about a guy who grew up a Boy Scout and a Catholic who was really passionate about these Native American stories, who started noticing similarities between parables about Christ and like these Native American folk tales that right. predated Christ and also had no way of, of, of being touched by Christian uh, culture. So he started, you know, his, his, his life work became comparative mythology and he, in mythology, doesn't, isn't just stories or on a campfire it's 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 pop music it's it's the dream you're describing to your friend on the subway it's 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 drawings on a napkin it's 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 basically everything i mean sure. there are three character archetypes in the romance of the three kingdoms none of which is sun Quan, because no one cares about sun Quan. just wait over there till we're done see how you are you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine the first is the child represented by liao bei the Jungian archetype of the child is represented as a longing for innocence, which is characterized by Liu Bei's sometimes foolish yearning for wholesomeness and piety. Also characterizing the child is the desire for rebirth and salvation. This messianic instinct is shown with Liu Bei's selfless goal to reunite the hand and to renew the nation. He is the Confucian idealist. The second is the shadow represented by Cao Cao. It's the archetype that contains all of the things that are unacceptable, not only to society, but also to one's own personal morals and values. The way this manifests for Cao Cao is his unscrupulous Machiavellianism. His usurpation of the Han Emperor is depicted as the most evil crime that could possibly be committed. He embodies the harsh realities of legalism. And lastly, there's Zhuge Liang. Zhuge Liang is the embodied spirit of Liu Bei and Cao Cao. He is the innocent, wholesome child in the Jungian sense, 
but he's also got the deadliness and the cunning of Cao Cao. Despite his Machiavellian nature, he doesn't get corrupted by malevolence in the same way Liu Bei did, and ultimately uses his power for good. His Jungian archetype is the self, or as it's known in the Maslow's hierarchy, self-actualization. In the spiritual sense, he represents transcendence. Like any hero's journey, the protagonist starts off weak, facile, and even a bit naive. We love Liu Bei as a character, but in the beginning, he can't really do much, can he? He's a neglected scion of the royal house growing up in poverty, he weaves mats for a living, and he's utterly at the mercy of his environment. The beginning of his hero's journey starts with the call to adventure, which is him taking up arms against the yellow turbans, something we didn't specifically cover in the series. He takes up arms for a noble cause, and then he gets supernatural aid. The supernatural aid comes in the form of the Oath of the Peach Garden ceremony, which isn't like ceremonies that we're used to in the modern day. A ceremony in the modern day, for instance like marriage, doesn't require anything, it's just your word. And it's not a surprise that divorce is so common because there's nothing to back your words, they're just words. Ceremonies back in the day on the other hand involved sacrifice. And that's exactly what the trio would do, they would sacrifice a black ox and a white horse. Those are not expendable things, especially if you're poor, it's the equivalent of you burning your wallet with all your money inside. So whatever oath they're taking, they must be pretty damn serious about it. Quote, We three, Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zheng Fei, though of different families swear brotherhood and promise mutual help to one end. We will rescue each other in difficulty, we will aid each other in danger, we swear to serve the state and save the people. We ask not for the same day of birth, but we seek to die together. May heaven be all ruling, and earth be all producing. Read our hearts. If we turn aside from righteousness or forget kindliness, may heaven and humans smite us. So off the adventurers go, spiritually infused with purpose. There are a number of characters in the book that qualify as villains. The Yellow Turbans, Dong Zhuo, Lu Bu, and Sima Yi, but Cao Cao was nothing like Dong Zhuo or Lu Bu, who relied on brute force alone. He was extremely cunning, and his Machiavellianism was three dimension in scope. The records of the Three Kingdoms describe Cao Cao as a hero who devised and implemented strategies, lorded the world over, wielded skillfully the law and political techniques, and unified the ingenious strategies of Han Fei. The world of legalism was about seeing the world in the most pragmatic and realistic sense. In the real world, the strong dominate the weak, the smart overcome the foolish, and this world is essentially just a Hobbesian nightmare of scarcity and gnashing teeth and endless power struggles. And is that wrong? Well, according to the Liu Bei's of the world, of which most people who grew up in the developed first world and get liberal arts degrees with their soy lattes and their veganism are, they'd say that all the fault lies with evil old Cao Cao, and if there were fewer Cao Cao's in the world, the world would be a better place. But in Cao Cao's worldview, Liu Bei putting his idealism ahead of his realism is putting the cart before the horse, and he's right, he's 100% right, and that's terrifying. The terrifying truth is Cao Cao is in fact a more evolved version of Liu Bei. What's the point of having virtue if you're not capable of backing it up with strength? Being moral but being weak doesn't make you a good person, it's just the equivalent of being a nice guy. You might say that someone who's incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty, but that's wrong. Because if you're incapable of cruelty, then you will 100% be victimized by someone who is. Part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect, because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous, and then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. Cao Cao is exactly that. 
He's the anti-hero. But let's contrast this with Liu Bei. When Liu Bu was defeated by Cao Cao, he sought refuge with Liu Bei in Shu province. And the second Liu Bei's back was turned, Liu Bu betrayed him and took Shu province from him. Instead of smiting a weakened Liu Bu, which was a clear and obvious danger to him, he welcomed him in. Does this make Liu Bei good? No, it makes him weak. Being no closer to his goal of reuniting the hand than he was at the beginning, he'd be forced to roam the land homeless, having thrown away his advantage because of his misguided sense of propriety. This is the complete opposite of what Cao Cao would do. With Cao Cao, remember when he's invited by his uncle Lu Bo Shi to stay with him, and Cao Cao misinterprets the sound of a sharpening knife outside his door as someone coming to kill him. Well, he doesn't discover that it was all a misunderstanding until he butchers his uncle's entire family. He thought they were plotting to collect the bounty on his head to give to Dong Zhuo. How then will he be able to reunify the land if he's dead? When the uncle comes, Cao Cao thought, I've just killed his whole family. If I let him live, he'll dub me into Dong Zhuo. How then will I be able to reunite the land? And as such, he kills his uncle too. Well, if you're run by cold-hearted pragmatism, everything about what Cao Cao has done is entirely rational. And this event highlights why Cao Cao became so successful. He was willing to sacrifice more than the other warlords. Liu Bei only sacrificed two measly farm animals, and he keeps being taken advantage of. But Cao Cao, on the other hand, was willing to sacrifice his whole family and is able to become the most successful warlord of northern China. In the eternal words of Cao Cao, I would rather betray the world than have the world betray me. In the satanic sense, the covenant made with Satan is formed by killing the person you are closest to, and this is a common motif in many movies. You'll never guess who Mao Zedong's favorite character in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms was. Sun Quan. Just kidding, get back in the corner. Okay. No, Cao Cao. He personally identified himself as a modern day Cao Cao, and it's no surprise. Mao saw himself as a pragmatist who was willing to get rid of his moral compass, not just for himself, but for an entire nation for a single-minded aim of building a communist utopia. Now, this is where it gets really intense. A long while later, after many trials and tribulations, Liu Bei goes full Darth Vader mode. He's got this big dream, and he's been utterly incapable of standing up to the likes of Cao Cao, and eventually, he just snaps, when he betrays his own relative, Liu Zhang, in order to capture Yi province. It's the first time that Liu Bei's done something so treacherous, and it ruins him, but for the first time, his rivals finally respect him. Liu Bei, in his encounters with malevolence in the form of Cao Cao, Lu Bu, Zhou Yu, and all the other villains of the story, forces him to encounter the Shadow. In the realm of the Shadow, there's everything that they can do to him, but nothing he can do to them. So as a result, the child walks into the Shadow, but he doesn't come out. Liu Bei is able to become powerful, but it's cost him something. His sacrifice of his own family member was no different to what Cao Cao had done to his uncle. With the unholy ceremony complete, Liu Bei was able to take control of the southwest portion of China and establish Shu Han as one of the three kingdoms. However, what we'll learn is that these unholy sacrifices don't come without a cost, and Liu Bei would find out the hard way when the emperor dies. With the death of the last Han emperor, Everything that Liu Bei has fought for, everything that he has rested his principles on, would die with it, and the only thing that he is left with is a deep resentment. This resentment is so strong that the entire purpose for his being would be about revenge, and the childlike innocence and Confucian idealism that defined him would die as he realized the truth about the world. In the words of Pang Tong to Liu Bei, to adhere to the ideas of abstract rectitude is to do nothing. One must be an opportunist, and next the weak, attack the willfully deluded and seize the recalcitrant. Those are some strong words, and at this stage of the story, Liu Bei doesn't have reason to believe that that statement is anything but 100% factual. 
The encounter with malevolence is a major feature of the human condition, and the inability to integrate these very rough lessons is what leads to resentment, as the suffering itself is enough to cause you to resent the very essence of being itself. In Liu Bei's case, the discovery of what is makes him bitter and resentful, and this is proven by the fact that Liu Bei takes his vitriol out on Wu instead of Wei. Wei was the one that usurped the 400 year old Han dynasty, not Wu. Liu Bei would take it out on Sun Quan, who he felt had taken the last remnants of his humanity by killing his brothers. The irony is, Sun Quan never killed his brothers, but they died as a result of their own vices. Guan Yu dies essentially because of his arrogance, and Zheng Fei dies because of his cruelty and brutality. He had nothing to do with Sun Quan. But knowing Wu to be an easier target than Wei for dishing out merciless retribution, Liu Bei puts the target on Wu and makes it his aim to sow destruction. It's clear that Liu Bei's goal was destruction because Sun Quan proposed to seek justice for the death of his brothers by offering to hand over Zheng Fei's murderers and offering to return Jing province back to Shu. So it's clear that with Liu Bei refusing this offer, his sole quest was to seek destruction. Quote, Sun Quan slew my brother, I hate him so much that I could eat his flesh with gusto and devour his relatives. A complete 180 in Liu Bei's character. And do you remember the oath that Liu Bei took in the Peach Garden? If we turn aside from righteousness or forget kindliness, may heaven and human smite us, and smited he gets. Liu Bei is defeated. His encounter with the shadow ultimately corrupts his soul, and all the good in him dies. Despite Liu Bei's fall from grace, there was a man who would pick up his mantle and continue the quest for righteousness. That man was Zhuge Liang. Unlike Liu Bei, Zhuge Liang embodies all the best parts of Liu Bei, but has integrated the darker, more Machiavellian elements to support his righteous cause instead of being overcome by it. Nietzsche said, He who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. When you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes back at you. Liu Bei's encounter with the abyss would destroy him. Zhuge Liang, meanwhile, embodied both the shadow and the child, and as such, represents the continuation of Liu Bei as a fully integrated human being, a self-actualized one. The most important part of the book, the real climax, is the debate Zhuge Liang is having with Wang Lung on the eve of a very important battle, and the debate can essentially be boiled down to Confucian idealism versus legalist realism. Wang Lung tries to convince Zhuge Liang that Cao Cao's forceful subjugation of the Han is a righteous cause, essentially pleading the case that in a dark, chaotic, despotic time, realistic action needs to be taken, and unnecessary ideals such as who is the rightful ruler and such need not be heeded to. He's pleading with Zhuge Liang to get his priorities straight. Quote, Heaven has its mutations, and it changes its instruments from time to time, referring to the mandate of heaven. And rebels have arisen like a swarm of wasps, stinging and impoverishing the people. Then the founder of Wei, Empress Sal, swept away rebellion in all directions, purged the land and restored order. All hearts turned to him in gratitude, and the people admired his virtue. He didn't gain position by force, but by the simple will of heaven. Wang Lung, trying to justify the authority of Cao Cao and his progeny, is ultimately defending Cao Cao's guiding philosophy. Cao Cao's philosophy is, the world is in chaos, the only way to restore order is to forcefully remove the failed authority of the hand and start from scratch under my leadership. And to achieve that end, I'm willing to do anything, no matter how morally repugnant. Sure, I've had to break a few eggs, kidnap the emperor, kill my uncle's whole family, Mutilate steal everyone's wives, hand, intentionally starve my own troops, tradition, kill the emperor's wife. Song. But in exchange, I've reunited all of North China and restored peace to the land. This is not a wrong argument, and you can't easily dismiss it. You can apply this argument to any society that has ever existed during a time of crisis. So the leadership fails, the government fails, the country falls into anarchy, and then something else needs to come along and rebuild its institutions from the ground up. Out with the old, in with the new as they say. The Han had their time, they failed in their responsibilities, it's time to remove them and build something better. 
This is the argument that Mao would have made to justify his communist uprising. And what can you say against this argument? This argument is completely justifiable. But what does Zhuge Liang say in response? In the final days of the Han, the officers of state were the authors of evil. The government fell into confusion and misfortune settled on the world. Because the household officers were corrupt and foolish, and the court officials were as brute as beasts, leaving only that they might feed. Because high people, wolfishly cruel in their hearts, savagely mean in their conduct, were in office one after another, and slavish flatterers, bending slavish knees, confounded the administration. Therefore, the throne became a waste heap, and the people were trodden into the mire. Zhuge Liang is reminding Wang Lung why the hand fell in the first place. It didn't just crumble into the dust for no reason. The reason it collapsed is because of the corruption of the officials, the eunuchs, and the governors. Because people in high places lost their principles and discarded their morals, they ended up becoming agents of corruption, acting like tumors in a body, feeding and leeching off its host. Fulfilling their duty to the emperor was done by acting out their responsibilities to the state, collecting taxes, repairing infrastructure, defending the frontier against rebels. But instead of doing their duty, these officials skimmed off the tax revenue, embezzled funds from infrastructure projects, and left borders undefended for their own gain. And these corrupt governors and generals would then carve out a stake of the rotting hand empire that they had helped destroy from within. You might say, it's not all their fault. The emperor was pretty bad too. The emperors in the latter stages of the hand were corrupt and foolish, but do two wrongs make a right? If the emperor abdicates responsibility and ignores his duty, then are the officials allowed to do the same as well? What about the average person? Are they then now justified to become a yellow turban and scour the countryside looting and pillaging? Because why not? Everyone else is doing it. No one else has integrity anymore, so why should I? The collapse of civilization doesn't happen in one stroke. It comes when every level of society abdicates their own personal responsibility, a race to the bottom in terms of morality. And that's exactly what happened during the end times of the hand. So these corrupt and traitorous officials who had abdicated their responsibility to uphold the integrity of the state, then decided to turn their back on the sovereign ruler and follow the biggest traitor of them all, Cao Cao. Quote Zhuge Liang. I know all about you, you, Wang Lung, and generations of your family have enjoyed the bounty of the hand. You came from the eastern seashore, you got into office with a recommendation of filial piety and integrity. You properly aided your sovereign and supported the state, cared for the tranquility of the hand, and magnified the Leos. But could one have imagined that you would turn and assist the rebels and enter in a plot to usurp the throne? You ever heard the saying, there's no loyalty amongst thieves. If you group together a bunch of traitors, have them establish a new regime, what's going to stop them from betraying the regime? One of their officers might get a little ambitious, and when no one is paying attention, he might usurp the throne in the same way Cao Cao did. Zhuge Liang is defending the principles that have allowed society to become prosperous and stable in the first place, specifically the Confucian principles. Number 1. Loyalty this specific aspect of Confucianism gets a bad rap because it solidifies a rigid social dominance hierarchy, a worthy critique. However, Confucius Amentius wrote into canon the rules governing the relationship between ruler and subject to stop the hierarchy from becoming authoritarian. The relationship is seen as a mutually beneficial two-way street with each party having responsibility to the other. Confucius himself did not say that might makes right, but rather that a superior should be obeyed because of his moral rectitude, and his subjects would reciprocate with loyalty in return. Mencius wrote, When the prince regards his ministers as his hands and feet, his ministers regard their prince as their belly and heart. When he regards them as his dogs and horses, they regard him as another man. When he regards them as ground or grass, they regard him as a robber and an enemy. Moreover, a good Confucian is expected to remonstrate with his superiors when necessary. At the same time, a proper Confucian ruler should also accept his minister's advice, as this will help him govern the realm better. In the end days of the Han, the ministers did none of these things and dishonored the sacred relationship between ruler and subject. Every act of disloyalty, 
from a local tax collector skimming off a few gold coins of the collection, to a peasant joining the yellow turbans, to Wang Lung, a privileged upper class governor of a province who would turn his back on the people that put him in power in the first place. Every act of disloyalty on every level is the reason why the hand collapsed and Zhuge Liang is making it loud and clear. Number 2. Filial Piety This is a virtue of respect for one's parents and ancestors, and at the time of the Three Kingdoms, their ancestors were the original Han. These are the people who overthrew the tyrannical Qin dynasty, unified the states, built infrastructure, developed culture, science, art, and protected the citizens of the country. A good Confucian has gratitude for the bounty they have received, and Zhuge Liang points out that despite Wang Lung having received his great bounty, he instead dishonors his ancestors by destroying what they had built. Even Liu Bei, a discarded scion of the royal house who grew up in poverty, would spend his life trying to repay his ancestors back in gratitude for what little he has. Number 3. Righteousness Beyond empty words, Righteousness is a responsibility to act in an ethical manner even when those around you aren't doing so. This runs counter to the strategies of legalism whereby righteousness is simply a weak spot to be exploited by your enemies. These Confucian edicts acted as the moral bedrock of society and they would be attacked by the lights of Qin Shi Huang, Cao Cao and eventually utterly destroyed by Mao Zedong 2000 years later. But that's a story for another time. For now, Zhuge Liang Countering Wang Lung's argument for moral relativism would rest his case, and so powerful was the truth, so sharp and potent was the truth, that Wang Lung was overcome it and he was struck dead in an instant. But as we know in the story, Zhuge Liang was unsuccessful in his attempt to reunite the hand, and most people who read the book get disenfranchised with the ending because they misinterpret the ending as a justification for evil and Machiavellianism. But it's more complex than that. The book is a Shakespearean tragedy, and in the end, no one wins. But the traitors were themselves betrayed, and Sima Yi would line for line do exactly as Cao Cao did. He would amass power in court for himself, use the emperor as a puppet, and his progeny would then dispose the child emperor, forming a new dynasty, showing us the inevitable conclusion of Cao Cao's legalistic philosophy, and thus disproving it as a long-term solution for a stable and prosperous society. Zhuge Liang was willing to sacrifice himself in order to uphold morality. As he said to a dying Liu Bei, I will wear myself to the bone in service of your son. And he does this all the way to the end, even when his enemies are giving him a chance to turn back and quit. Despite facing a far stronger nation and having all the odds stacked against him, Zhuge Liang didn't once consider stopping until he either succeeds or drops dead. The sacrifice of himself to bring due justice is a selfless act that ultimately provides the example for the audience for what the perfect individual should be like. One must be willing to sacrifice themselves entirely if they desire to uphold their moral integrity, even if it means failure in the end. As the saying goes, if you have nothing to die for, you have nothing to live for. As the audience, the lessons we can extract are the weakness of Puritan idealism, the strength and failure of Machiavellianism, and the necessary sacrifice required to uphold the truth and righteousness. Let's not casually throw away these ancient stories and let's see what ancient wisdom they have that can be applied to our lives. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to give a like and subscribe to see more. I still have more to learn, so leave a comment below and tell me what you think. I'll see you in the next video.